During World War I, from 1914 through 1918, humanity was locked in a constant struggle. The warfare was intensely brutal, and most people scarcely remember the overshadowed diplomacy that eventually brought an end to the violence. Furthermore, many of the lesser-known conflicts and hidden agendas of the participants in the war have been long forgotten or ignored. One of these particular subjects was the German plan to capture Russian oil fields before the war's end. The oil fields that the Germans had their eyes on were actually located in the Caucasus within a region that had been won by the Russians during the Russo-Turkish War back in the 1870s. Consequently, the Ottoman Empire was also heavily focused on seizing the same territory that would soon be the target of the Germans and a few other belligerents. Nonetheless, for now, we have to take a look at what would lead to the German campaign by the end of 1918. This episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. Curiosity Stream is the Netflix for history and science lovers, and it is also extremely affordable at under $20 a year. This is my personal favorite streaming service, a place where I can watch these well-made documentaries and learn more about different topics like science, tech, history, and more. One of my favorite documentaries is called Apocalypse World War I. This documentary traces the journey of civilians and soldiers who fought for survival in one of the darkest times in history. Click on my link in the description for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series, and use promo code Knowledgeia and you will save 25% off, which comes out to only $14.99 a year. So click the link below or go to curiositystream.com slash and start learning more by watching incredible documentaries. At first, the main threat to Russia's control over the Caucasus was predominantly the Ottoman Empire. Since they were hoping to recapture the lands that had already belonged to them, the Ottomans were strongly determined to at least win back Batum, Kars, Artvin, and Ardahan, and from there, open up more possibilities to expand further. This plan quickly received significant support from Germany, although for selfish reasons. If the Ottomans could distract the Russians on the Caucasus front, it would weaken the Russian resistance against the Germans on the Polish front and elsewhere. So, Germany decided to supply the Turks with the necessary resources to allow the Ottoman Third Army to launch the ideal diversion. A combination of the Ottoman Third and Second Armies totaled between 100,000 and 200,000 men, as opposed to only about 60,000 Russian men in the Caucasus. The latter was actually just over half of the Russian Caucasus army due to the fact that the Eastern Front against the European powers was a drastically higher priority to Russian authorities, which had prompted the deployment of an additional 40,000 troops of the Caucasus army to the Eastern Front instead. Still, Russia was not alone in its fight against the Turks. The Brits were greatly opposed to an Ottoman campaign into the Caucasus due to British involvement with and ownership of the Anglo-Persian oil company, which sat directly in the potential line of fire. Many Armenians came to the aid of their Russian allies, and multiple Armenian generals led their own units against the Turks on the front lines. And finally, Rounding out the Russian opposition, an allied coalition led by Lionel Dunsterville totaled almost 1,000 men from Britain, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Using this ragtag team of allies, the Russians decided to make the first move in the area and declared war on the Ottoman Empire on November 2, 1914. The Ottomans reacted fast, and armed conflict followed shortly as some Kurdish and German troops joined the Turkish offensive. By the start of 1915, the Ottomans were struggling, largely due to the intense degree of Armenian support the Russians had received. The Battle of Gallipoli came as a much-needed victory for the Turks, but nonetheless left the authorities back in Istanbul deeply concerned about further Russian or Allied attacks on their homeland. 
The Caucasus campaign and subsequent conflicts between Russia and the Ottoman Empire carried on until 1918, partially resolving with the signing of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Only a couple of months later, though, it would be the Germans who now stirred things up in the region. The formerly Russian-ruled Southern Caucasus was now the Transcaucasian Democratic Federative Republic, although it would soon become the independent republics of Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. Germany's particular interests as this shift happened were in the newly formed Democratic Republic of Georgia and the Baku oil fields in Azerbaijan. While the Ottomans had moved their focus off of Russia and now onto the republics of the Transcaucasus, Germany saw the perfect opportunity to take advantage of this turmoil, and Georgia in particular felt that the entry of Germany into the region could actually protect the young republic from both the Ottomans and the growing fallout from the nearby Russian Revolution. The Treaty of Poti was then signed between Germany and the Democratic Republic of Georgia on May 28, 1918, which gifted recognition of the Republic's sovereignty and protection from Germany to Georgia in exchange for a plethora of favors, such as free passage through Georgian ships and railways, access to the occupation of any strategic points seen fit by the German expeditionary forces and the establishment of a German-Georgian mining operation. This was the start of an important collaboration for Germany, and on June 10th, the German troops arriving in the Georgian capital of Tiflis joins Georgian troops for a joint military parade only days after a treaty was signed between the Ottomans and Armenians. The German-Georgian coalition began to set up garrisons throughout the Republic. It became abundantly clear, if it had not already been, that the short-lived alliance between Germany and the Ottoman Empire was over. The Germans, who had once assisted the Turks in the Caucasus, were now ready to kick them straight out. When the Ottomans realized that their former friend was now aiming for the same targets as they were, tensions quickly escalated into a Turkish invasion of the city of modern-day Tashir, and the attackers took a handful of prisoners, leading to an intense message of warning from Berlin. The Ottomans knew that Germany not only wanted to take the Baku oil fields, but they were also eyeing the Baku Batumi pipeline, which were both targets for the Turks' ambitions as well. Nonetheless, after skilled negotiations by the Germans, the Ottomans succumbed to the demands of their foes and fired their general, Vahip Pasha, and agreed to temporarily back out of the race to Baku. Jumping on this newfound advantage, the Germans swiftly brought over additional divisions from the Balkans and entered into diplomatic talks with the Russian Bolsheviks. The latter soon agreed to promise Germany one-fourth of Baku's oil production in exchange for German action to expel the Ottomans fully from the region. The Germans first tried to use negotiation yet again to persuade the Turks, but this time their demands were ignored and the Ottomans were ready to march on Baku. This resulted in the Battle of Baku, which saw the Ottomans and their Azerbaijan allies face off against the troops of Russia, Armenia, and soon Britain. The clash included the March Days and September Days tragedies and had to be ended by the signing of the Armistice of Mudros on October 30th, 1918. Although the battle ended with an Ottoman-Azerbaijan victory and the official change of Azerbaijan's capital to Baku, the consequential treaty would later become the start of a total collapse for the Ottoman Empire. Meanwhile, the Germans had hoped to take advantage of this increasing chaos and the building coalition against the Turks, but a streak of bad luck complicated matters severely. Political turmoil was becoming a growing concern back home in Germany by the time of the Battle of Baku, and the importance of the Baku objective began to dwindle in comparison. Though the Germans would have loved to stay and consolidate their influence and growing authority in the region through both warfare and diplomacy, the situation at home hit a crucial point of concern. On October 21st, all German troops in the Transcaucasus were recalled back to Germany, and the Baku campaign was fully abandoned. 
With the entirety of World War I coming to a close at long last, Germany had officially lost its chance to seize the oil fields of Baku despite the early progress that had been made. Regardless though, the plan to do so had not been entirely foolish either. It made sense for the Germans to initially support the Ottomans in the Caucasus, given that their first and foremost focus needed to be dealing with the Russians elsewhere, such as on the Polish front. But that didn't mean that Germany had to abandon its own plans in the region. As things settled down and the Ottomans had been weakened from all sides, it opened up the perfect door for the Germans to swoop in and attempt to lay claim to the oil fields. The alliance with Georgia was also an immensely crucial part of the plan, and the diplomatic skills possessed by the Germans that were utilized to persuade both the Russians and even the Turks temporarily were widely impressive. The end to the Great War and overall wrap-up of hostilities made a return to the region no longer doable despite any hopes of success from the Germans. So. Although the German plan to take the oil fields once dominated by Russia was not actually a horrible idea and was fairly close to working, ultimately, triumph would escape the Germans once more, and we are left only with the knowledge of how they made their attempt.